really stonewalled on the um, new Imperial because we're waiting for the chromium to come back. In the meantime, we've had, this is a four cylinder Froon, Burt Froon. He was a great designer, a great um, builder of exotic motorcycles. This is in the 65, 70 era. We bought this about 18 months ago. Very bad state, bad condition. So John Ring, our top racing engine man, John does all our racing engines. He's had this, he's rebuilt the engine. This uh, Burt actually used NSU barrels, pistons, heads, and made up the crank, and used the cranks too. So he made up the crank cases and hooked them all together, which was quite a good idea. When I raced for NSU, uh, I went to the factory at Neckel Zoom when I was uh, doing the German Grand Prix and coming back from the Italian Grand Prix. They took me around the factory and showed me the NSU, and I always remember being mesmerized at the uh, fantastic work they did. The barrel, that's the first, that's Nicosil, which is a, like a, a chrome <clears throat> finish on the, straight onto the aluminium. And they were the first manufacturer to use Nicosil, which everybody uses today. So again, lovely lightweight, fantastic wearing qualities, NSU and good, good sporting engines. So we pop that back in the frame and I'm just working on all the carburetors, which is no mean task. So if you see how all this works, you've got the, the first lever operating there and then that comes back, operates here and opens and closes all the um, slides together. And you've got to be very careful when you're setting up four cylinders that they all start opening together. So you've got to be very fine in the adjustment to get all the, um, you don't want one cylinder far enough before the other. That's an Albion gearbox, four speed, close ratio. This is the float chamber here. See how neat and tidy that is, how it's sprung loaded. With a float chamber, if you can isolate it from the engine vibrations, um, it steadies the flow feed. Can you imagine the, the, the frame vibrating like mad and the float chamber vibrating like mad and the fuel inside going hysterical? So not good. Lots of the um, mountings were all worn out, so I've got that all together. Bert used an MV, this is an MV 200cc chassis. Um, and wheels, nice wheels, single cam. While we're on different engines, four cylinder, two stroke, we'll have a look around the museum at um, other exotic super engines. <laughs> Another interesting special, the Mitchell, 1959. Again, another brilliant designer like Bert Froon. As far as I know, that's the only four cylinder, 50cc racing motorcycle in the world. He built it again in his shed. Lovely design. And I remember when we got it, we were short of a carburetor and some slides. So Miller said, whoa. Cross, where on earth am I going to get um, slides and another carburetor for the Mitchell? Check them out, all the jumble Miller's wandering around, and all of a sudden he sees a couple in a box. So I said to the bloke, I said, Oh, how much do you want for them? He said, Oh, five or eight, you know. So I said, Okay, I'll have that. He said, How many more do you want? And I went, What? He said, Yeah, they're off. Cycle Master, the BSA Cycle Master engine. So you've got this Cycle Master there. That's the same card runner that's buried in the back there. Um, on the four cylinder Mitchell. Right. Looking at um, multi-cylinder engines, well, this is the ultimate. This is the V8 Motor Gutsy. Uh, that's the crank of it there. As you see, it's twin rods like that, which are quite unique. But that's probably why how you get eight cylinders. Eight carburetors. I can tell you when you're working on carburation on that thing, 
it's a bit serious. They change the slides on that, <clears throat> or the needle position is like two hours work to get it done. So that's the V8, so that's eight cylinders. Um, we can now move down to another um, four cylinder, 125 Suzuki, the RS67. That's four cylinder V4, 12 speed gearbox, which is just phenomenal. And um, this was a forerunner of the RG. Wonderful bit of tack and gear, and uh, John Ring did the engine up and that. So, really interesting. 24 gears in the gearbox, so um, more like a clock inside than a gearbox. So, we've done a four cylinder. This is another four cylinder here, uh, which is the Koenig. That's a flat four, um, flat four outboard engine, two pistons, common crank in the middle. Very, very successful. Almost won the world championship. And this is a three cylinder um, outboard again. The Crescent from Sweden, uh, raced the Swedish Grand Prix, Mick Grant rode it. Uh, very nice bike, but super lightweight. You see the little little engine, um, 500cc, no weight at all, and of course, very very powerful and uh, very successful. Not complicated, which is good. So we'll move on to some other engines. That's an epic twin cylinder. The bicylindrical motor gutsy. One poking forward, one back there, 120 degrees. That was Guzzy's biggest mistake ever dropping this because they started <coughs> using, designing this about 1935. Stanley Woods, great Stanley Woods, won the TT and uh, they developed it. Then in about 50, 1950, they decided to drop it after they were winning Grand Prix. They went back to the signal cylinder and layout and then later the V8, but then they sort of sideline the 120 degree V twin. A few years later, along comes Ducati with a 120 degree V twin, cleaned the world up, sold thousands, maybe millions of V twin Ducatis. So big mistake, but Guzzies. This is a, a famous engine here, AJS. This is 1939, when Britain led the world. V4, liquid-cooled, supercharged. The great Walter Rusk, who was actually a friend of my brother. Um, Walter and Fred, they lived on the Antrim Road, and family lived on the Antrim Road. They both joined the RAF, more or less, together. Fred, luckily, he survived the war, but unfortunately, Walter Rusk crashed and was... Um, uh, lost, but he had the honour of being the first man to lap a Grand Prix course at over 100 miles an hour. 1939, Ulster Grand Prix, Claddy Strait, there you go, Walter Ross, 500 HS, gold medallion, first rider lap British circuit at over 100 miles an hour. So that was the poster that AJS put out. Great bit of history. Then the next one down again is a fantastic bit of gear, the Porcupine. You wouldn't need a lot of knowledge to know why they call it the Porcupine because all the cooling fins are like the Porcupine fins. So first bike to win a world championship, 1949, the great Les Graham, who incidentally again was a bomber pilot. Um, he flew Lancasters during the war, won the, the first World Championship on that bike, 1949. So he beat all the Nortons, the MVs, the Gilleras, on twin cylinder. This is another rare, rare bit of tack here. This is what you call three cylinder, two stroke. DKW again, German, very, very quick bike. Um, one cylinder pokes forward, two cylinders vertical. When I was racing NSU, Ulster Grand Prix, 1956, um, they 
asked me to have a would I ride um, one of the Ulster Grand Prix as a one-off ride and unfortunately they had previous Grand Prix that lots of the engines blew up so they didn't have a spare bike for me so one of the big regrets that I didn't get a ride on a 350 three-cylinder DKW in the Ultra Grand Prix, but there you go. Right, we'll move on down. I think this is an exotic bit of tack here. Uh, Motor Villa, Italian. Um, and 1969, again, a work of art, four-cylinder, uh, Walter Villa. They, they ran a 125 V-twin like that. And then he decided, he would double up, put two together to make a 250 winning Grand Prix bike. Did all that work in 69, got it all ready to go. And 1970, new regulations, FIM, cut down the number of cylinders. You could only run twin cylinder, five speed gearbox. So never ran in a Grand Prix because this, the uh, regulations were changed. You could only run it twin cylinder. Talking about rear engine si system. This is a red rock. Charles Red Rock. Three cylinders. One, two, three. Goes that way. Radial. Very smooth. Red Rock was a, another genius who came up with all sorts of wonderful ideas. Quite a lot of aircraft influence. After this First World War, lots of the engineers who were working on aeroplanes all of a sudden were out of work. So they put their designs towards motorcycles. Um, lots and lots of manufacturers who made aeroplanes during the First World War, like a propeller there. That's a Martin side propeller. And we've got a Martin side motorcycle down below. So we'll have a look downstairs and show you a five-cylinder motorcycle. Right. We have done single cylinders, twins, threes, fours, eights, but there's half a cylinder, what they call a split single. EMC, the great Joe Ehrlich, the idea was to split a single barrel into two. Why is that? Because you can use this cylinder more or less as a supercharger where that piston comes up first, pressurizing the fuel that's coming up this before the explosion. So you get very high compression. That's the cylinder head there combined. But with the pressure generated by the backs, cylinder coming up in front of the other one give you a lot more compression and um, they race them quite successfully too board racer where we race them in America around banked um, drones. As you can see it's an aircraft engine. Just coming up the First World War. Verdale, France, Paris, near Paris. So obviously somebody grabbed an aircraft engine, decided to put it in a motorcycle. Uh, 750cc. I like riding it quite a bit because that's the advanced retard. Little lever there for you. That, that is very critical. And the difference in performance, just having the ignition crack on different atmospheres and stuff, you can really get it tuned in. And uh, you've only got one brake. That's the tron what they call a transmission brake. You have no gearbox, just direct drive and a clutch, but that's your, um, your only brake and a bit of a stirrup brake in the front. It, it's really, a push bike with a 750 engine in it so you can imagine it goes quite well good for 80 to 90 mile an hour if you're brave enough no suspension so really um it isn't the speed 
of the engine that's the factor. It's the road holding and suspension that you can't give it anymore. So really 1912, that was the, the finish of them because the factory was destroyed. So lovely bit of gear, lovely bit of tack, racing stunts and uh, off you go. Early Christmas present somebody. Thank you.